welcome to session 12 of the SCTS Foundation Doctor Academy teaching program. Um, I'm delighted to, to be joined today by Mr. John Edwards, who's a consultant in thoracic surgery and major trauma at Sheffield Teaching Hospitals, and who's an expert in this area. So we're very honoured to have you this evening, Mr. Edwards. So without further ado, over to you. So yeah, thank you for the invitation. It's, um, it's always nice to do a slightly different talk to slightly different people. Um, I uh, find myself doing lots of talks on chest trauma and it's usually to, to people at a, at a very high level. So it's actually nice to bring it back down to earth and just reflect a little bit on what, what's important for, uh, for, for the, the, uh, the trainee, if you like. Um, and we're going to talk um, about all sorts of different things. Um, but I guess the first thing to talk about, perhaps, is, is a classification of, of, of chest trauma. And, and th there's, there's lots of different things that we can think and talk about. Um, and, uh, and that includes penetrating trauma, which can affect the, the uh, chest in, in many different ways. And then there's different types of, of blunt trauma. So that can be either um, direct trauma, um, which is which causes injuries, as you can see there, or, or sometimes with a with a crush injury, you can get a, a slightly different pattern of, of, uh, of injuries inside. The other thing that you can sometimes see is, is deceleration injuries. So um, typically in a, in, a, in a high velocity road traffic um, collision, uh, where you can get a typically, for example, an aortic injury um, as a result of sudden deceleration. And, uh, and that's not necessarily in, in, in association with a, with a blow or, or blunt trauma itself. And then you can get blast injuries and then you can get some, some other curious things. So you can get diaphragm or costal margin ruptures as occur um, when a patient coughs or sneezes or vomits. And uh, you might not necessarily think that those are, are chest trauma, but, but they are. Um, and so they do need to be included in, in, in a classification. I'm going to run through the um, what was once the official slide deck for ATLS, and I hope that ATLS is still a requirement for surgical trainees of, of, of all different specialties, um, because it, I think it does focus the mind um, in a difficult situation to dealing with, with chest trauma. So the numbers are pretty much the same in that, um, that in, in penetrating chest trauma, about a third, up to a third of patients may require surgery of some description. Um, but the majority of those will be relatively simple procedures. And it's important in, in ATLS protocols that we do our best to identify um, chest injury at the earliest opportunity, ideally in the primary survey. And uh, it's useful to think also a little bit about why we might get problems occurring in the chest. And uh, it's always nice to add a little bit of trivia to talks. And uh, when um, one of those issues and one of those major issues that we come across in the primary survey is, is pneumothorax. And, uh, and, and we need to think about, well, why, why can pneumothorax be a problem? And uh, we can think back to the, the, uh, the native population in North America who did very well at practically wiping out the, uh, the buffalo population through uh, recognizing that, that it only took one arrow to cause a pneumothorax that was fatal. And the reason for that is that buffalo only have one pleural cavity containing two lungs. And, uh, and that is actually the case in some humans also. And there's a, a paper published just this year looking at the, the legend of the buffalo chest. So pneumothorax is something that, that can be um, found and uh, in the primary survey, as well as obviously airway injuries um, and open pneumothorax, as, as well as tension pneumothorax, and then flail chest, which we're going to talk about quite a lot later in this, in this um, presentation. And then hemothorax and tamp tamponade are other um, life-threatening injuries that occur in the primary survey. And these may require prompt management, either by drainage, clearing the airway, um, getting venous access and placing intercostal drains or pericardiocentesis. Laryngeal airway is a, uh, airway injuries as a cause for airway obstruction are pretty rare, um, but treatment is to try and, and, and gain security of the airway, which can be extremely difficult. It may be possible to intubate the patient very cautiously, ideally with a, a highly experienced anaesthetist, but it may be necessary to perform a prompt tracheostomy in order to secure the airway. <laughs> 
Tension pneumothorax um, is something that, again, is seen from time to time. It's often seen um, in a less dramatic form than you might see, that you might see in, um, in the textbooks. Um, everybody thinks that it's a rapidly fatal disease, but actually in the spontaneously ventilated patient, it's actually not as, as fatal as you might think. And, uh, and you may see a fair amount of, of physiological compromise, but often that's self-limiting. But it is important to recognize and to deal with that through decompression um, and ideally with it being a, obviously a clinical rather than a radiological diagnosis. With an open pneumothorax, um, again, we do see that from time to time. Um, and there it's important to try and gain closure so that we can get lung expansion, um, placing a chest drain and using typically a three-sided uh, dressing, which can be made very simply, but there are um, fancy versions that are available. And ultimately, of course, these are going to require surgery to, uh, to close the, the open pneumothorax. It's actually pretty rare. Um, I I've only seen in my career probably four or five um, cases of these, um, usually due to penetration trauma of some description. We'll talk a lot more about flail chest in, in, in due course um, as to what we mean by that. Um, but the, the, the critical thing is, is the recognition of paradoxical motion, which can cause significant um, embarrassment to, to breathing and may again require prompt intubation. And uh, the key there is to is to try and keep the lung expanded um, and to maintain oxygenation and obviously to ensure adequate analgesia for what is a very painful condition. With massive hemothorax, um, you, you, again, this is something that should be recognized relatively early. And with the, the use of ultrasound in resuscitation areas, it's, it's a lot easier to diagnose than it, than it used to be. Um, but uh, so the clinical diagnosis is, is, uh, is of um, lesser importance now that we have better ways of, of uh, diagnosing it radiologically. And uh, the, the key there is to recognize that when um, a chest drain is put in in a patient with a massive hemothorax, you may be turning a, a kind of closed hemothorax into an open hemothorax. And therefore, having the availability of, of volume, rapid volume replacement is extremely important in those cases. And with cardiac tamponade, again, it can be difficult to diagnose. Um, and the, the classical signs may or may not be present. Uh, and again, ultrasound is a, a useful way to, to diagnose that, although formal echocardiography can be quite, quite tricky, um, but it is important to recognize. Um, it's important to, to, to realize that um, um, pericardiocentesis is not something that is done in isolation. It often requires surgical exploration following this. And hence, it should really only be performed when we have the, a prompt route through um, to the operating theatre. What about resuscitative thoracotomy? Well, this is something that, that is um, called upon on from, from time to time. Um, and uh, it's ideally um, thought of as part of the, the spectrum of damage control surgery. And this is an extremely good paper from a guru of, uh, of, of chest trauma worldwide, um, Dr. Molnar from Hungary, who um, has created his own um, uh, models for, uh, the, for, for practicing damage control surgery. He takes courses around the world in a, in a, a suitcase. Um, he's quite a character. And, uh, and certainly, if, uh, if you want to, to learn more about um, damage control surgery, this is clearly a paper that, that needs to be read. It's freely available, thankfully. In terms of indications for an, for an emergency department thoracotomy, they are relatively rare, um, but relatively dramatic. And ideally, it should be for penetrating thoracic injury where the patient arrests I, um, sort of as they come through the door. Um, if it is seen before hospital, then it can be something that's, that's that where, where um, it may well not be effective. Um, so it's, it's about prompt recognition and prompt treatment at the, at the, in the appropriate way. For blunt thoracic injury, although it is, is listed as a, 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 an indication, um, generally speaking, the, the um, performance of a ED thoracotomy in those cases is, is not, um, not one that is met with a happy outcome. Um, and certainly for a blunt uh, trauma patient where you have no witness cardiac activity, um, the, the likelihood of, of, uh, of success is extremely low.
The aim of this is to relieve cardiac tamponade, control hemorrhage, and potentially assess for internal cardiac massage. Um, there are different techniques that can be used, but, but predominantly the, the best technique is to guess which side from clinical examination or a fast scan um, you wish to perform the procedure. But generally speaking, a left anterior thoracotomy is easily um, transferred into a clamshell going across the, the, the midline um, through the, the sternum to the other side if necessary. And then that can be extended up and down um, to get access to, to all four body cavities. That's namely the, the left and right pleural cavities, the pericardium, and also the abdominal cavity. The disadvantage with a sternotomy is that actually access to the, the chest is, is less good. It's good for the heart, but it's not so good for the, the pleural cavities. And it's, it's much more difficult, for example, to control the aorta through a sternotomy than it is through a left anterior thoracotomy. Um, and the other thing is that uh, a clamshell can be performed with little more than a knife and a pair of, of, of German shears scissors. Um, they have to be decent quality scissors, having said that, and some of the ones I've tried on sets recently haven't been so good. And hence a, a jiggly saw is, is often um, stopped in emergency departments for the, uh, the use of an ED thoracotomy. But as I said before, and I'm going to say it again, it's really only indicated in patients with penetrating injury um, to the heart or, or the, the lung, um, where pulse, pulseless electro, electrical activity is seen just before, at or just after the, the emergency department door. And, uh, and that's probably the most important thing. So what about the, the secondary survey and, uh, and other issues? And there are, there's again, there's a, a long list of potentially lethal injuries that we can see in the secondary survey. And these, these include simple pneumothorax, hemothorax, tracheal tree injury, blunt cardiac injury, traumatic aortic dissection, mediastinal traversing wound. And there's, there's a lot of these. So pneumothorax, again, is, is uh, again, relatively easily treated it's, and recognized, um, treated with a, with, a, with a chest drain. Hemothorax, again, um, is something that, that hopefully should be seen and, and um, recognized with, with radiology prim primarily. Primary contusions can be can be seen as well, and uh, and and don't forget that in the days that ATLS was first first established, the use of CTs were relatively rare. Whereas now it's so common that that, that the finding of primary contusions on CT scans is is very is is very common indeed. Blunt cardiac injury is, is uh, obviously not seen radiologically, and, and this is where if you have patients with blunt um, trauma to the chest, it's important to monitor these patients with an ECG, and again these days to perform baseline um, highly selected troponin to give a, um, an indication of, of, of contusional injury that can then be monitored primarily. But and unfortunately, more than, than that, it's actually quite difficult to, to, uh, to treat apart from ensuring adequate perfusion and treating arrhythmias. Traumatic aortic dissection is a, is a, uh, a, a or traumatic aortic injury rather, is a spectrum of disease that can, um, can be manifest from, from a, a small um, tear in, in the aorta seen on the, on the um, contrast enhanced CT scan um, through to intramural hematoma or to um, leaks of various different types and is a, a complex area, particularly with the advent of um, vascular radiology. Um, but it's again is something that is is seen, and it's it is primarily these days treated with vascular radiology rather than than uh, cardiac surgeons. But it's something that you, again we do need to know about, and the diagnosis primarily made by by angiography and the typical um, position where you see filling defects is just beyond the the left subclavian artery, and you can see here some hematoma and a, and a leak. So this is clearly a little bit more um, troublesome and injury. Diaphragm rupture on the left is very easily seen. On the right, it's very difficult to see, and, uh, and it may require even thoracoscopy to diagnose. And, uh, and I think the, the important thing from a, a th thoracic perspective is that it's very easy to, to treat either from the chest or the abdomen, depending on um, the other findings at, uh, at radiology. Um, so it's something that we, we, we kind of share with the general surgeons, the work, depending on the, the amount of, of uh, uh, and the pattern of chest trauma that we see.
And we do sometimes see traversing wounds across the mediastine, which are pretty dramatic, um, tends to be um, through from gunshot wounds, um, which thankfully are pretty rare in, in this country, but do require um, very um, complicated and, and, and prompt workup. And then, of course, with associated injuries and, and, and uh, blunt skeletal injuries, which we've come to in great detail, there's um, a lot that we can, can talk about and, and will do so. Esophageal injury is something, of course, the esophagus is part of the chest, and, uh, and that's something that we can see if we've got pleural effusions, mediastinal air, um, and it may well be necessary to perform a contrast swallow or esophagoscopy to, uh, to diagnose these. And again, prompt diagnosis can lead to prompt surgery and therefore the, the best outcome of results. So the important things to try and avoid um, are to avoid a simple pneumothorax becoming a tension pneumothorax, um, to, to avoid um, the retained hemothorax, so that's where repeat imaging may well be necessary, um, to avoid missing diaphragmatic injuries, and then to, to, uh, uh, to fail to recognize the severity of blunt trauma by means of rib fractures and pulmonary contusions. And the elderly is something, again, that, that, that is very important to recognize that chest trauma in the elderly um, can uh, escalate quite dramatically. Topic about um, VATS. So VATS in chest trauma has been used extensively. It isn't really a place, uh, has, having a place in damage control um, on the basis that uh, it requires single lung ventilation and damage control is about the hemodynamically unstable patient. Um, and so it's not sensible to, uh, to consider VATS in, in the unstable patient. But it is useful for assessment for, for injury at, a, at a, a slightly later stage to, to evacuate those retained hemothoraces um, for removal of penetrating instruments, um, which was my actually my very first experience of, of um, VATS in, in trauma was, was doing exactly that um, for a patient who fell on a mirror of all things and had a piece of, of mirror inside his chest, which was quite fun to remove by VATS. But it has to be done again in a patient who is hemodynamically stable. So when it comes to blunt chest trauma and rib fractures, um, this is, I guess, my the, the area where I've got most experience um, in chest trauma and where everybody has most experience. There's a lot that we can talk about, and uh, these are some of the uh, the uh, the talks that are currently um, sort of you know on the back burner, ready to give to anyone that wants to listen to them. Um, and I'm not going to be able to go through these. So what I've tried to think about is what are the top topics that are relevant for trainees, um, and I think these are kind of six things that we can try and adjust with um, with thoracic trauma. So what are the indications for CT scan? How should we classify injuries based on the CT scan? What's the optimum non-operative management? Because let's face it, the majority of patients with rib fractures are gonna be managed non-operatively. But when it comes to surgical stabilization of rib fractures, what are the, the, uh, the, the past trials that have given us the evidence base and the current trials that are ongoing at the current time? Where does that lead us in terms of indications for surgery and how um, do, we, uh, do we keep on top of things? So, it's always good to find a consensus statement and uh, and I was part of this consensus statement that led um, to the formation of the chest wall injury society and if you want to learn anything about the the uh, blunt chest injury then the chest wall injury society as at the bottom of most of my slides um, is the the place to go and so this um, article in injury um, five years ago now um, was effectively a systematic review where we went through every single bit of evidence that we could find that would have anything to do with, with um, surgical stabilization and rib fractures. Now that included um, such things as, you know, the, the, whether to give antibiotics for chest strain, you should, um, how you should manage pain, um, how we should assess patients with, um, with radiology, um, through to surgical techniques and so forth and indications. And it's a very comprehensive article that I commend to you. What are the indications for CT scan? Well, I guess this is fluid and there is no clear evidence-based consensus for this. It has to be said that CT scans are now performed much more frequently than they were. And, uh, and to be honest, most of the discussions I have about the, the numbers of CT scans being done and the indications for it are the radiologists complaining that there seem to be too many CT scans that are requested by emergency departments um, and asking me to try and rein them in a little bit. 
But I guess if we're being pragmatic about it, um, CTs are, are recommended if we have three or more rib fractures that are visible on a chest radiograph, if on examination there's paradoxical motion visible, or if we have a patient with significant pain despite um, parenteral analgesia. And uh, that then leads to how we should try and classify the, the fractures that we see. So you may be aware that there is the AO foundation. And uh, if you've done orthopedics, you may well have come across AO classifications in, in many different types of, of trauma. And effectively the AO and the Orthopedic Trauma Found Association produce a compendium of rib fractures every few years. And this aims to assign a number to every single type of fracture anywhere in the body. That allows coders potentially to, uh, to, to record these and then to link these in, in large data sets to outcomes. And it was only in 2018 um, that the thorax um, was included in the, the uh, fracture compendium. And uh, some colleagues of mine um, put together a series of definitions um, based on the, the laterality and the rib number, and then some idea of whether the, 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 where the site of the, the fracture was. But this was fairly crude and basic. And although they included some characterizations of the, the fractures, um, they didn't really um, look at trying to understand what was, for example, a displaced fracture or what, what was a flail chest, what did these things mean? And so it was with one of my BMed Sci students, who's now a foundation doctor himself, um, Pete Clark, um, and together with the Chest Wall Injury Society collaborators, that we tried to um, look at the the, the literature and uh, and ask questions based on the literature search um, to give us um, definitions that we could at least put a draw a line in the sand and decide where they're going to be. So that included, um, a, a, in total, through the different rounds, 100 or more um, surgeons from all around the all around the globe, um, on most continents, but not everyone, and uh, and that allowed us to um, produce a a, um, a Delphi consensus. Um, process where if, for example, you um, you take um, this this second um, row on the first column um, asking about um, displacement. And what we did was we asked questions in the first round and then refined those questions according to the answers that we got until we um, received an answer that we felt was was um, a consensus, as you can see in, in this, this type here. But there were um, areas where we didn't get that predefined 80% consensus. So, for example, in, in, in some of these here, you can see that after round two, um, we, we, we were clearly not going to get a consensus because there was a lot of disagreement, but that at least allows people to start talking. So what that did was to allow us to come up with categories of displacement that you can see here um, on the, the far right, um, where we just felt that we should um, categorize displacement of rib fractures according to undisplaced, offset or displaced. So we have a definition and that is according to the degree of contact. So undisplaced fractures had nine, more than 90 percent of cortical contact An offset fracture had had. Um, sorry, there's a misprint there. Naught to 90 percent of cortical contact. And then a displaced fracture is where there was no um, cortical contact at all seen. And we use the AO nomenclature in terms of simple wedge and complex fractures to describe the individual fracture that, that we've seen on each rib. But then we also started to think, well, how when we have um, neighboring ribs that were fractured, how should we describe that relationship? And so we felt um, in, in this consensus document that the appropriate way to describe fractures on the third, fourth, fifth, sixth ribs and that seem to have some form of association, we should call those a series. So a series of rib fractures is, is where we have uh, multiple rib fractures occurring down the, the chest. You can also have sporadic rib fractures, which do not occur in a series. We talked about path, um, the the uh, the. Um, sectors as to which um, regions of the chest wall these these were involving and we felt that anterior lateral and posterior sectors would be appropriate um, a costal cartilage and probably a paravertebral sector but there's a lot of um, debate and we didn't quite get as far as agreeing consensus about the boundaries between these sectors which is subject to ongoing work <laughs> 
flail segments is is um, and a flail chest are, are words that get banded around um, frequently by radiologists. Um, but but this slide is quite interesting. So I think the most important thing is to recognise that the radiology describes a segment, but it cannot describe what's happening at a a dynamic level. So a flail segment describes the radiology, whereas a flail chest describes the paradoxical motion that we can see on clinical examination. And there was strong agreement about that. In terms of the definition of a flail segment, um, the agreement was that it would be where we have more than three ribs fractured in, in equal or more than two places. Interestingly, going down to the, to the, um, the next two points, um, we didn't agree on how many ribs needed to be displaced for a segment to turn into a, a flail chest. Um, in other words, what was predictive on a CT scan? Was that predictive of there being a paradoxical motion? And that was something that we were unable to, to see um, in, in this um, process. And in terms of where we had fractures around the paravertebral sector, again, there was there was a disagreement as to whether those should be included in a flail segment. And indeed, subsequent work that Pete Clark has, has performed that we've published suggests that, that um, when you have a series in the paravertebral sector, these tend to be quite stable and non-contributory in the same way as fractures that are seen lateral to the costotransverse ligaments. So how do we sort of use these um, definitions? Well, this is the form that, that I like to use um, in my practice and try and encourage my, my colleagues of all different levels to, to use. If we talk about, for example, a, um, you know, a lung cancer opera, you know, patient, we don't say um, in the MDT, oh, I've got this patient with lung cancer, can you operate on them? without any further information. You want to know a lot more about the, 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 uh, the, the character of the, the lung cancer. Um, you don't say that uh, when you've got a, um, you know, acute abdomen, oh, this patient's got, got uh, abdominal pain, can you operate on them? You need a lot more information about that. And so just to say, oh, we've got a patient with rib fractures, can you deal with them? Well, that doesn't tell us very much. We want to characterize the injury and hence using the taxonomy that we've published is a way of characterizing the injury and making it graphic so that you can then understand what the issues might be. So this is the, the form that we use. And just to zoom in in uh, greater detail, um, we, we have the um, we, we have the, the definitions to some extent um, of the three sectors with the paravertebral and the costochondral cartilages included, the darker gray here being the costal margin, which we'll come to in, in a minute. And that then allows us to, to plot on here where we can see fractures. And, and immediately you start to see that there is something going on here that may or may not be significant. I've, I've excluded the fact that these were simple wedge or complex just for, for, um, for um, to make it easier. So I guess what I want to know um, is, um, well, this is quite an important point. I get a little bit upset in some degrees when people apologize for phoning me in the middle of the night because um, it is my job to, to pick up the phone and talk to, to, uh, to, to trainees of all descriptions. Um, so, I, I, you know, you don't need to apologize, but we have this patient and this patient seems to have two fracture series and you can then characterize them. You can say that there's an anterior fracture series from four to eight, and a, with some of those displaced, there's a lateral fracture series of three to seven, again, with four of these offset and three undisplaced. And then with the overlap that gives us, that tells us that there is a flail segment. So already, even without me looking at the scan, I've got an idea that there is actually a, um, you know, a, we have a flail segment here. It's a displaced flail segment. This could be a very significant injury. I'm actually going to have to get out of bed and, and log on to PAX and look at these images um, because it may be that we need to do something quite quickly. So here we go. So here is the anterior series of fractures um, from six to nine with the four displaced fractures in the middle of that series. Here is the lateral fracture series from three to seven, again, with, with um, four of those offset. And then that allows us to see that we have a four um, level segment, um, a, a flail um, segment here. And with that being a displaced flail segment, that certainly suggests that, that we may well have um, a significant injury here. So what about the costal margin and costal chondral fractures? Well, these again are something that, that exercise us. They are typically um, rarely reported on CT scans and yet can cause a significant amount of instability. The problem with cartilage fractures is that they don't bleed 
Um, and uh, whereas broken bones heal, ligaments and cartilages are, 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 are much worse. And as uh, you guys get older and you start getting creaking knees, you'll realize that cartilage injuries are, are a lot more troublesome than, uh, than fractures. And, uh, and so one of the things we recognized was that the, the, these were poorly um, um, characterized and that there were um, lots of different ways that these were described, but none of them were particularly um, helpful. So we used um, the concept of sequential segmental analysis, which is beloved of, of pediatric cardiologists, to look at the costal margin, the diaphragm and the intercostal muscles to come up with a whole series of different definitions um, that, that can be can be used for um, for assigning injury and uh, and again this is an interesting paper it's a rapidly um, growing area and actually of the things that I'm I'm known for kind of internationally strangely costal margin in injuries seem to be the uh, the thing that uh, that, that that carries my name furthest um, which is kind of curious really um, but that's really because we've been systematic over the years of, of, um, of identifying patients with costal margin injury and writing them down and putting them into a database and uh, and that's a message that I, I I can't implore on you enough if you see interesting cases just record them because you never know when you might find yourself with a series of interesting cases that nobody else has got and then uh, then you're riding a wave of, of interest that can take you into interesting places let's go back to ribs so what's the optimum non operative management and I guess the key here is to recognize that there's a number of complications that can occur with rib fractures and that includes um, acute and chronic pain um, pleural collections of all different types and I haven't included pneumothorax in that um, but you get all sorts of different problems there um, pneumothorax of course itself and then um, pneumonia abdominal injuries all these things can occur and so you have to have your eye on all the different potential complications when considering non-operative management and how that might slide into operative management there are a number of different pain scores um, but the most important thing to realize is that the regular pain scores that are, are used in the, the new scores and so forth, um, effectively, you just get a nurse asking a patient, have you got any pain? And they say, no, but that's not actually important because you need to know a bit more about that. You need to know whether you've got pain and when your patient moves, breathes and coughs. Um, because that's what you've got to do. And quite often when I see a patient, I'll, uh, um, you know, the, the, uh, the, 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 the on-call staff will say, oh, his pain is well controlled, but I'll go to the patient. I'll say, right, can you sit forward? And they can't. Um, can, you can you sit forward and twist? No, they can't. Can you breathe? Can you cough? So actually you need a dynamic pain score. And hence the Prince Henry Hospital pain score is one that is, is quite widely used and quite useful. Um, and the following slides that have, have come from uh, my colleagues in, in Hull um, are, use the Prince Henry score um, on a very regular basis on, on, in every observation um, time to try and get a, a better feeling of the dynamic um, issues that are to do with, with pain rather than just the, the kind of you know, one-off asking, are you in pain, um, which isn't good enough at all. And so the Prince Henry pain score can then give you um, rise to an, a, an algorithm that, that then um, allows you to consider um, what type of pain relief you should use. And, uh, and so that may be systemic analgesia. Um, if you've got not so much pain, um, which might be just tablets, but it might be, um, might be a PCA or, or other things, um, or a regional block. And there are different types of regional block. And, uh, and hopefully you'll be familiar with, with some of these. Um, an epidural is the kind of you know, the highest level of regional analgesia, but actually um, that isn't quite as, as widely used now. We have come across um, much easier to place um, blocks such as a serratus anterior plane block using the, the, um, the, the, the planes of muscles underneath the, the, uh, the skin um, or an erectospinal plane block. And these are very good ways of getting um, broad analgesia over multiple rib levels um, that, uh, that can be easily placed by even a you know, physician's assistant. It doesn't have to be an anaesthetist that places these. And certainly in, in, in our um, hospital, it's the PAs in, on the, in, the, in the critical care departments that are um, placing these um, hopefully very soon in a 24-7 basis. And that allows um, rapid 
uh, control of analgesia with the idea that when the patient leaves the emergency department, they go to the, um, the operating theatre suite, have their, um, their regional block before they come to the, the, um, the ward, whichever ward that may be. So that's something that's that's really important to realise is that there, you know, that, that regional analgesia is a very important part of, of rib fracture management. Then when it comes to risk scoring, so the next thing we need to think about is not just pain as a, a, um, a, a an arbiter of risk, um, but whether there are other things. And you can see here in these blocks, um, in, in these boxes that they've that the whole team have included age, the ability to have a good cough, um, anticoagulant use. So that's something that has been um, widely established by um, um, a, 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 an academic physiotherapist in Swansea called Kerry Battle and the stumble score, um, which is um, for use in emergency departments quite widely now, um, includes um, the, the number of fractures, but also anticoagulant use as, as being a reason to admit to the patient. Um, so moving from that, you then um, have the, this, the, uh, the regional block form, which again has been very well thought out. Um, and then the daily checks. So you want to work out whether a patient's deteriorating. Um, you may be able to determine that instantly on the CT scan, but it may be that what you require is, is a, um, a, a serial measurement of some form. Um, and that can be the serial measurement of the Prince um, Henry Hospital pain score, um, but also the thing down the bottom here, the physiotherapist doing vital capacity, um, but also incentive spirometry. And, uh, and these things can be very useful. You'll see some pictures in, in just a minute. So this is the, the what Hull use on a daily basis for their, their rib fracture patients. And, uh, and if you're doing this regularly and you're recording things and you're seeing it on a chart, it does make you think, has there been deterioration? And, uh, and particularly if you've got different teams on different days, it makes it much easier to identify patterns if you've got um, objective scores rather than those that are subjective and reliant on the individual. And RIB score is, again, a score that has gained widespread traction. Um, it was originally described by um, Dr. Pieracci in Denver, who is a trauma and thoracic surgeon. And, uh, and he came up with this idea of just adding points together for more than six fractures, flail segments, bilateral fractures, and dis displaced fractures. Sorry, Siri wants to join in, so I do apologize for that. Um, and uh, whether we've, we've got um, different sectors involved and also first rib fracture. And that gives you a score out of six that has been validated as a, a useful score to use to uh, determine future risk. What about physiologic scores? Well, the sequential clinical assessment of respiratory function, the SCARF score is something that is really, really useful. And this is something that is gaining traction. And, uh, and this is something that uses a numeric pain score. Um, and then it uses incentive spirometry, um, the res a high respiratory rate or a poor cough. And, uh, and when you um, add those together, you get a score of four. And if they trigger, then that gives you um, cause for concern. And, uh, and what they did was that they used, again, the incentive spirometer. And again, it was Pierachi once more um, who published this. And when you look at the, the outcomes of that zero to four score, so they looked at all different things in this wonderful, wonderful paper um, and in terms of different types of risk. And here, for example, is intensive care unit stay um, and uh, the likelihood of prolonged stay on the intensive, um, on the expensive scale unit, on the ITU. And, uh, and you can see here that, um, that you, you had a, 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 a linear relationship and a decent RAC curve um, suggesting that the SCARF score was very good. Now, interestingly, um, when you look at the SCARF score um, and you look at rib score, um, you look at the number, that total down the bottom, six, um, total there, four. What about adding them together? And that's something that this group have done, and, and I expect that we will see their, their paper fairly soon, um, that if you aggregate your RIB score and your, um, your SCARF score together, then that gives you a very powerful number to use. And if you plot that out on a daily basis, that will give you a trend very quickly um, as to whether you've got a deteriorating patient. But in terms of, um, of you know, identifying those again, you can see that the, the, the Denver team uh, came up with, with um, those, those features that, 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 that feature in the, in the SCARF score um, to help determine whether the patient should be admitted, um, and if so, whether they should go to a hydrodependency area.
So what about moving towards those patients that you might want to operate on? Before we come to guidelines, I think we have to consider the, the evidence base from some past and current studies. And, uh, and there were kind of four or five studies that, that, um, that, that, that sat with us for a number of years before the, the more recent studies, which are ongoing. And, and again, these are being published all the time. So it is a field that is changing. The, um, one of the first studies that came out was um, using struts that squeezed around the ribs and, and Tanaka's um, study from way back 20 years ago now um, was a small study that was where patients were randomized five days after ventilation. And, uh, and you can see here that there were beneficial outcomes to the, the patients having the surgery group. Um, a, a, another study a few years later from Gonetsi um, looking at the use of K wires where they put K wires underneath the skin, uh, through the skin, underneath the flail segments and then back out through the skin with a cork on each end to hold it in place curiously. And, uh, and their study, well, these were patients before they deteriorated. And what they found was that, not surprisingly, there were more patients that, that were ventilated um, after surgery, but the duration of ventilation, the ITU stay and the hospital stay was much shorter in the patients who underwent surgery. And they also looked at um, some physiological outcomes and found better vital capacity um, a couple of months after the surgery. Marasco, Silvana Marasco is at the Alfred Hospital in Melbourne in Australia, and she um, is a, 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 a prolific author of some extremely good studies, particularly looking at quality of life. And, and she's now um, completed a couple of randomized studies uh, looking at, at chest trauma. And the first of, of hers was a much bigger study than the previous ones looking at, uh, at chest trauma. When I say it was much bigger, they assessed lots of patients for el eligibility, but it was still only 46 patients that were randomized. So um, still a small study, um, but it would be nice to get some bigger studies together. What they did look at, however, was a number of different outcomes, and they found that ITU utilization and ventilation um, was less in patients who, who um, were uh, underwent um, fixation. Um, and also when they looked at cost savings, and this is in Australian dollars, which I don't know what it is at the moment. It used to be two to one, but I fear it is no longer. Um, and uh, you can see that they were cost savings in that bottom line, bottom two lines for patients that had surgery. <clears throat> the British study, the ORIF study, is ongoing, and, uh, and this is an ambitious study that um, seeks to recruit 500-odd patients, and, uh, and it's something that is, um, is where randomized um, patients will be between fixation versus not, and this tends to be in, in patients who are deteriorating. And uh, <clears throat> the difficulty with that is that many patient, many surgeons will feel that if you've got a patient who is deteriorating due to a flail chest, actually surgery is indicated in this group. But at least this study, if, if and when it does finally recruit, it will um, give us some, some better data on which to, to base some decisions. So the primary <clears throat> outcomes we have here are mortality and quality of life with a number of, of secondary outcomes here. And you can see that recruitment has been challenging. And, uh, and even before COVID appeared around here, you can see that recruitment was falling behind the, um, the planned accrual. And, uh, and when you um, look at what's happened since COVID with the recovery plan and opening lots more centers, um, the, uh, the, the recruitment rate is still falling behind. And we will have to see whether we do um, manage to get to uh, um, 532 patients, because that's where we should be already. Um, and we still have 200 or so to go. So it is a study that deserves our support, um, but has an awful long way to go before we, we get um, final recruitment. And uh, you can see that, uh, sorry, I should probably go back to that. You can see that there are a number of centers that have opened who have not yet um, managed to recruit um, a, a large number of patients. And hopefully that uh, we'll be able to bring some of these centers on and find some other centers um, uh, to, uh, to help um, with this study. So thinking forward about what are the indications? Well, we have to uh, consider um, where we've come from. And uh, when I first started 
fixing broken ribs, dare I say it, back in 2006. The first patient that I saw is this chap who uh, fell off this rock in the Peak District, Lucy's Slab, um, a, a well-known bouldering route um, with a nice little warm-up, and uh, he fell from this and suffered the injury you can see on the, the right-hand side. And at that time, there was nothing to guide us in terms of guidelines. Um, we had no knowledge of techniques. There was no equipment. Um, there was no... Um, no disposables that we could use and so we had to make it up as we went along and it was really only after our first seven cases were presented at SCTS in 2009 uh, that colleagues and other centres um, decided to kind of join us on the the uh, the journey of, of understanding what um, what what we we could achieve with surgical stabilisation of, of rib fractures and the, uh, it, the, the the proof I guess is in in how things have changed over the years. Um, one of the things that our hospital insisted upon was to uh, ask us to to um, to put together a, a, the the uh, the new technique as far as they were concerned and put it through the t the so-called ten point plan, um, which was quite onerous and and involved um, the, uh, the mainly clinical governance issues as well as the business case for it and that required us to inform one of these steps in there is to inform NICE um, if uh, it was something that hadn't been performed before. Well, indeed, that was the case. We weren't aware of anyone performing um, rib fixation, so we informed NICE, and that was true. And uh, that led to an interventional procedures advisory committee meeting, which is, again, a topic of a talk in itself. Um, but that resulted eventually in some NICE guidance, which is pretty limited, to be honest. And uh, all the NICE guidance says is that you can do it, um, but you need to be careful and you need to audit what you do. Um, and that's all that was said, really. So it's not as if it's the sort of type of NICE guidance that tells you when to, when not to, how to, how not to, what you can and can't do. It basically says you can give it a go if you like. And to be honest, some further NICE guidance is, is, uh, is well overdue, um, but is something that hasn't yet um, occurred. So what about indications? Well, this is the guideline that um, that we adapted from Mike Bemmelman um, in, in, uh, in the Netherlands. And we published this in the Interactive Journal a few years ago um, to look at the fidelity of our practice. And, and uh, what my BMED Sci students did was to um, blindly assess um, 96 odd cases um, that we fixed and sorry, of whom half we fixed and half we didn't. And uh, the investigators didn't know um, what the how these cases were managed, but we fed them the information you can see here. And that allowed us then to work out how accurate the, the guideline was. Was. And what we found was um, that it was indeed pretty good. So we didn't tend to fix patients who did not um, follow their way through this flow chart and find themselves in the surgical fixation box. Um, and similarly, those that were fixed, uh, most uh, sorry, those where fixation would have been indicated, almost all of those were fixed. The reasons they weren't um, was, for example, if they had competing injuries, typically traumatic brain injury um, or other major injuries where they were um, critically ill and on the ventilator for a long period of time. Um, the, the kind of the, the, the question of being ventilator dependent wasn't asked for many weeks. Um, in which case the chest was already stiff and, and they didn't require um, fixation. So th this guideline, I think, is actually a pretty good um, uh, way of working out whether you should fix somebody or not. Um, and I would suggest that this is something that you pull out and, uh, and use because it will help you decide if you're not sure whether to or not to. This will give you a, a pretty good effort at um, guidance. So where are we in terms of the UK? Well, in, in 10 years ago, the, the 22 major trauma centres, adult major trauma centres in the UK were established. And we know that over the, the, uh, the last 10 years, the, the, these have um, commenced um, um, SSRF programmes. And in addition, we also know that uh, there are other um, non-major trauma centres that have large thoracic practices, um, the units here, um, who are also performing surgery for rib fractures. But equally, we know it's not just cardiac and thoracic surgeons that are performing this. Um, it's being done in conjunction with orthopaedic and trauma surgeons um, or with orthopaedic and trauma surgeons doing, doing this by themselves. 
And certainly the biggest centres such as Nottingham and Aintree um, in, in the country and Birmingham also, the biggest centres, it tends to be the orthopaedic and trauma surgeons that are performing the service. Um, and so that's something that will depend on, on local factors. Um, and certainly in Sheffield, we started it and with before very long, the orthopaedic surgeons um, had lost interest and, uh, and it's a practice that we've continued to, uh, to this day. And when you look at the, the evolution of the, the, uh, the, the, the numbers, you can see that there's been a, an exponential increase, um, which is stabilized over the last six or seven years. And in fact, probably in the last two or three years with COVID and the, 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 the reduction in major trauma that we've seen, um, we've probably seen a reduction in the number of cases. And TARN, the Trauma Audit Research Network, again, is something that you should be familiar with and, uh, and is very useful at pulling out data um, and allows us to ask all sorts of questions. And, uh, and many of our trauma cases that we see with rib fractures find themselves um, being included in the TARN data set. And Helen Ingo, um, who's a, a trauma surgeon from, from the Northeast, um, has published, again, a very useful paper a couple of years ago, looking at the chest wall injury data set that we put into the um, into TARN, um, which gives us some interesting um, insights into the management of, of chest trauma in the, in the country. So this included 16,000 cases of whom just 400, 2% un underwent surgery. And you can see the different mechanisms of injury here and, uh, and the, the, um, the, the gender differences so that, and the age differences. So the majority of these patients were, were well, two thirds, if, if not more, were over 50 years old. Um, so you can see that there's you know, some of these are already some interesting patterns coming out. So under the admission specialty, thoracic surgeons may think that they admit all these patients, but absolutely not. If you look nationally at TARN, it's about one in 12 of the patients with multiple rib fractures end up under us. 11 out of 12 do not. And even in a major trauma center, um, you will find that, that, uh, that, we may that the majority of patients are not under cardiothoracic surgery. Um, I can, again, talk about patient flow at great length and where these patients are, but they are in multiple different specialties. And, uh, and so it's, it, is, it is true that, uh, that you, know, you need to go looking for these patients if you want to find them. And you need to establish chest wall injury, patient pathways using the trauma coordinators to identify patients as we do in Sheffield. They ping us an email and ask us to look at scans of patients under elderly care. So, it, you know, there's an awful lot that goes on um, to identify patients and make sure that, that they're being managed optimally. And again, you can see in terms of the, the, the it's about half and half of these patients with three or more rib fractures um, that are managed at major trauma centers. So that means that half are not um, so are they, you know, what, what, how are they characterized? You know, what are the issues there? Um, so how, how do we communicate with the, the trauma units um, about these patients? It's all sorts of questions that we need to ask. Analgesia, we talked about analgesia. And if you look at the, the number of patients having epidurals um, and having, having different types of, of local anesthetic blocks, very small number. Is that appropriate? Hmm. Well, it's interesting how the, number, the, the proportion of patients having a PCA um, and yet the, the, the number of patients having a regional or local anesthetic block of all the different types is very much smaller. So when it comes to predictors and uh, predictors of fixation, you can see that there are a number of different predictors that, that she found, um, those being admitted to major trauma centers. You can read these quicker than, quicker than I can. So there are a number of different predictors, which again, give you some, some ideas as to the type of patients, but these are more associations rather than, than useful in determining pathways. You can, again, one of the things that we saw when we, we looked at in our, our questionnaires, the proportion of patients with more than three rib fractures having surgery. There's a great variety between the different centers that you, that you can see. So what about techniques? Well, we're, we're nearly there. Um, there's an awful lot can be said about techniques and, uh, and it really depends on what type of system that you have in your hospital. And in, in, uh, if you go around the Western world, um, there are a number of different techniques that, that can be used to, to, uh, to fix with different plates and screws. But in, in the UK, there's really only three um, slash four th um, that are, uh, are available. Matrix rib on the left is, is slash was the most widely used 
system um, that was very much first generation and uh, then ribfix blue came along as a kind of second generation system um, which is um, which has a number of different um, advantages over the, the the first generation and the careless martin l1 rib is is just been launched in the uk but as far as i'm aware hasn't been been used by anybody yet um, and the meta expert system that has been used for for um, for Paxis deformities for many years has been used for for root fixation as well. Coming is endoscopic vats um, fixation using um, wires to pull um, struts that are screwed in just two places underneath rib fractures. And this is something, again, that hasn't yet come to the UK, but will be coming soon. Um, and uh, and is something that, that some, certainly excites the Americans. Um, but whether it's better or not, that's a, a completely different question. So just to give a case, um, just to sort of you know give you a flavour of the sort of cases that that, that come to us, um, this is it's always nice when a patient gives us a, um, a a picture just before they suffer from their injury. And this is a, a 90 year old man, um, a real case who had a number of comorbidities that fell from a ladder whilst cleaning leaves in a in a gutter. And, uh, and you can see that on his chest radiograph, it's actually quite, quite difficult to see what's going on. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to go into that much more than to say that there is his age um, to show you the dates um, to prove that he was 90. Um, and I'm hopeful that this will play. Um, I might not play it all the way through, but um, this video, which is just um, of um, a, a, an axial video, we often do use 3D reconstructions. Nice as I guess low, did you spot that? Um, but if we look down in, in the posterolateral um, sector, you can see there's some displaced fractures there and also laterally. And, uh, and when you look at the, and, and characterize the injury, you can see that he's got a four segment displaced flail and uh, in that situation, in that sort of patient, that's a very significant injury. Um, and so we need to then decide what we're going to do with this chap. And uh, when you go and talk to your critical care colleagues and say, I've got this 90 year old guy with this, these ribs, they will probably laugh at you. And uh, so you then have to decide what you're going to do in advance of that discussion. Um, you have to ask yourself, are you going to treat conservatively with a regional catheter of some description, CPAP? Um, are you going to jump in there and say, actually, this patient needs plates and screws? Um, you're going to be putting a 90 year old chap and ventilating him post op um, with those comorbidities and intensive care unit. That's quite a scary proposition. And uh, or are you going to just accept the inevitable and say, well, look, this guy, this morbidity, mortality risk is so high. Um, we're just going to give him some morphine, make him comfortable, call the family in and say, look, this is a pre terminal event. There I say it, that does happen, and we do that um, more often than you might think. So, well, what we did was we fixed this patient, just to prove him there's the same date of birth, and, uh, and we got on promptly with this guy. And just to introduce the concept of ER to OR, um, so this guy came in on the 17th in the middle of the night, and uh, he had surgery the same day. Um, he went to intensive care unit that evening. Now, why did it take that long? It took a long time to call the family, to assess the patient, work out whether this was something that we really wanted to do. Um, but actually, he didn't spend very long on the intensive care unit. He spent a night and then he went back to the ward. And that was because we got on top of his pain. We avoided the, the evolving physiology of pneumonia. And yes, it took him a little while to get going. And that's because we, in, we, we made sure that all the socials were sorted. Dare I say it, it takes just as long these days. Um, but the comment from the intensive care physician that looked after him was, is pretty telling, really, um, that he said that this guy had absolutely no chance of survival if we'd not fixed his ribs. And that tells us something that, um, you know, the, 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 it tells us so many things operating on the elderly patient, identifying the injury promptly, um, getting them to the, th to the operating theater as soon as we can. All these things are, are really, really important. Just as the, the regional analgesia, all those things are super, super important. So in terms of learning, um, there are lots of lab courses, and, uh, and this is a Godava course with which I'm, on, on which I'm participating in a, in a few weeks' time, um, and they are extremely valuable. You have a lecture series where we can go through these sorts of things in more detail um, and then have experience of the systems in, in the Godava setting, and then ideally take that to the, the operating theatre thereafter. Um, but there is no better way of doing it than, than, than learning um, from, from somebody that's doing it.
So we've come a long way. We've learned lots, but there are things that we don't know. We still don't know a, a great deal about case selection in the non-flail setting. We don't really know enough about injury patterns and scoring systems. Um, but hopefully with collaborative data collection and better instrumentation and potentially intrathoracic fixation, we will get to a position where we, we learn a lot more about rib fixation. So that's hopefully where we'll come um, in due course. So in terms of golden points, I think you probably realize where they are, but the, um, the, the main things are to I sort of you know, think about key references to hold and uh, it's easy enough for, for, to, to identify um, if you look rib fractures and randomized trials and, and rib surgery and fixation, you'll come across the randomized study pretty quickly. And if you search for these guys who are seminal leaders, um, they're on the, most of the papers that I've written about rib surgery um, and the chest wall injury society is something that you should familiarize yourself with as well. So much of what I've done in terms of outputs has been through the the the, uh, the four Smurfs, um, the the BMedSci research fellows who have produced seven or eight papers on rib fractures over the years now. Um, but of course, I couldn't do this without my my colleagues, um, uh, particularly Jagan Rao, um, but also um, Lara Sochi, Sarah Tanconi, and David Hawkinson, without whom I wouldn't be able to do any of this. And uh, I guess the most important picture to show in any talk about chest trauma is your helicopter and your helipad, um, which uh, makes a big difference to what we can do.